Hey everybody and welcome back. It is still cold here, but we are doing okay and I'm kind of warming myself by my, well it's not a computer fire, but it's a warm computer, um, to play some Yen Lane. And I'm really excited to bring this to you today. I've only played a couple of games with her, but i um, already starting to get a little bit of a sense of how she operates. And I do have two decks that I would like to go over, but we're only doing one today just because I always make the videos too long. I always want to cover too much. Um, so I'm going to hold myself accountable here and just put out this, which is more than enough information because we're going to do a nice deep dive on this deck list in particular. Kind of my thought process, as I always like to share. Um, can't wait to hear, you know, please like, comment, subscribe. I've had so much more engagement on the recent videos. I love hearing from y'all. Um, doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's just about your day, whatever, like... You guys are humans on the other side of the screen um, who are watching this, you know, maybe sipping your coffee, hanging out with folks, you know, chilling at home. Um, I'd love to hear from y'all. So uh, let me know what you think, and uh, let's just get into it. I'm, I'm really excited for this. So uh, this is the first draft. This is the exact build that I kind of was shaping in my mind, or close to it, I think, when I even did a preview of what I was thinking in Yanling's, like, release video. Um, and I think the white splash is the most common that I've seen. I think there, uh, are other valid splashes like green and red. I won't go too into that cause I think we'll get there in some other videos, but today we are going to play with the first draft of Yan Lang, which is splashing white. Um, so real quick, just going through for anyone who didn't see Yan Lang. So she's got 24 health. She's got Tempest Insight, which says you got to connect with two, at least two creatures and you can draw a card for the turn. And then she's got her signature cards, which we will go through because they're all in the deck, even though I think there might be some tweaking that's needed. We'll see. So let's start with the land. Now, I think that the land that I've seen, at least when I've played against Yen Lang, um, is not Talarian Academy. It is Rooftop Laboratory. Um, and I get that, right? I mean, it's, it's a land that doesn't really interrupt your curve if you're playing an aggressive deck, right? Um, and... You know, it potentially gives you a boost of just raw card advantage at a really crucial turn. Um, and it might be the right land. However, I want to explain kind of why I started with Talarian Academy. Um, and I am interested to see if it proves its purpose. Um, and so, you know, it had been changed a little while back. So for those who might be rejoining from, you know, a couple patches ago. So now it reads the first artifact that you play each turn costs one less. Right, and starting turn five, you have a chance to add a random artifact to your deck. This was essentially a nerf to laboratory maniac strategies, um, which were just like having all these cheap artifacts making their deck cheaper, just this like crazy efficiency. Um, and I'll explain why we're running this for certain cards, um, and we'll see. I don't know that this is the best land to be running, I'll be completely straight with you, um, but. I think there's a logic to it, and I do think that it synergizes with what we're doing. So that's where we're st I always like to start with the land, because I think that is really important for, you know, kind of explaining what the deck is going to be trying to do. The other card that I think doesn't bear a ton of explanation, but let's go through it, is Oath of the Paladin. Always been the linchpin of any sort of white aggressive strategy. Now, we are definitely an aggro deck. We are an evasive aggro deck, which also means that spells like Aura of Courage can do a lot of work, right? Because when you play evasive creatures, you get to set the pace, right? If you're beating them in the air and they can't block, right, and they're attacking you back, you get to choose when you want to block, right? They don't get to do that unless they have reach creatures or creatures that specifically interact with flying creatures, right? Uh, obviously, if they have flying creatures. So... A spell like Aura of Courage, right, can make the difference of like, okay, we're kind of trading even, we've got a couple creatures, board presence is, is at parity, right? Um, and then I slam Aura of Courage, and suddenly I'm outpacing you for damage that turn, and I'm going to keep doing it, right? Unless you interact with me, or unless you outrace me. So Aura of Courage, right off the bat, obviously is good. Faithful Seed, I'll explain why, is just kind of, always a good one drop to have in this sort of style of deck and divine smite right it's just spotting you a free removal spell yes it is conditional right the conditions you got to meet is deal damage to an enemy creature for each friendly creature you have right so 
you got to make sure that you're curving out and going wide to get the most value out of the card. But uh, it's just the perfect um, kind of starting sequence of cards for what we're trying to do. That's That was originally why I was like, I'm pretty sure we're going to splash white. I'm pretty sure we're going to play Oath of the Paladin. And it's honestly pretty analogous to some of the early Gideon builds that people were working on. Um, except I think it's got a little bit more going for it, actually. But, you know, we'll see. Maybe Gideon also will make a resurgence. I, I played him a bit today, actually, um, before I hit Mythic. And um, I rattled off like four or five wins into, you know, some other aggro decks and some control decks. And I'm, who knows, may, maybe he is also a more competitive deck now, which I think would be interesting to see. Okay, let's talk about the white splash real quick, right? Because we only have six slots. We got to make them count. So Oath is one. Fledgling Griff. My logic for playing this card, although it's not a very powerful card, it is a one drop, essentially flyer, right? On your turn. Right, we've got the heron in the background actually, um, and uh, fledgling griff just does what you need it to. It's one mana, pecks in for one damage. It's evasive, it's cheap. That's what you need to be doing to get your passive where you're drawing an extra card each turn. Right, we knew how baseline that was okay for Teferi, and then when they bumped it to two, it like definitely made Teferi very competitive. Um, I feel like they probably started Yanling on one card. Uh, because maybe in testing two cards was too crazy. Um, I could see that for an aggressive deck, you know, drawing two cards against, you know, mid-range and control might, like, really shore up, you know, the downsides of playing an aggressive deck. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know that they're going to change that anytime soon. But Fletch and Griff, I think, you know, enters into a good spot in the curve. And then one of my favorite white cards, Paragon of Balance, if you have not played with this card... It, it could be really nasty. Um, and in conjunction with Aura of Courage, it can be even more broken. So let me explain the logic here. So it's it's a 3-3 three, three for 3, okay, fine rate. And its debut says, set the power of all other creatures to their current health, right? And so just to take an example, why Lil Foggy is in this deck, the cutest little guy on the planet, he has a 1-3 one, for 1 sneak ward. Wow, super unimpressive. When you play Paragon of Balance, this becomes a 3-3 three, three sneak ward for one, right? So Paragon is, is literally taking, if something has zero power, right? If it's got three health, now it's a 3-3. Three, three. So what Paragon of Balance enables the deck to do is also really abuse Aura of Courage, right? Because if I'm setting everything to equal, or if I'm even gaining a couple advantages here or there, Aura of Courage is going to push literally all of our creature stats above our opponents which means there are some lines of play where like your opponent is literally having to chump every card that you have on the board so there's a really clear synergy between aura of courage and paragon of balance and um you know what i'm going to say fair fight for last because that's that's a fun one so we've gone over some of our splash we'll go over fair fight at the end um so what do we need to do we need to be aggressive we need to be efficient and we need to cobble together enough cards to get through, punch through some damage and get our card advantage rolling as soon as possible. Manic Constrictor was also a, a nice um, addition to Gideon Splashing Blue as well. It's a one mana 2-2, two -two, so it's a, it's a solid rate, and it raises the cost of the next card your opponent draws by one. You might not think that that's that impactful, but when you're playing aggro, making their cards come down potentially one turn later can make a huge difference, right? Because we only have a certain amount of mana each turn, we only get one more mana each turn unless we're ramping. So Mana Constrictor can really make your opponent's draw stumble, right? Like, it's the cost is, is upped by one. There's nothing you can change about that. It's not like, you know, um, Thalia, which does it for one turn. And Thalia could be a good metagame call, also as a white card, but we only have so many slots, and I want it to start from a place of just what might be consistent. So Mana Constrictor fits in, Guard the Flock. It's just a really cheap, helpful trap. Not everyone's going to run into it. Not everyone will respect it necessarily either. You know, it's a one mana counter, something that targets something, right? Or one mana that, um, you know, is, whether it's a, an ability like a debut trigger of like Goblin Shortcutter, which I actually countered with Guard of the Flock, which, actually, which allowed me to win the game. 
Um, and I don't know that my opponent like knew that that could have happened either. So when people start to play around Guard the Flock, it gets a little harder, but Guard the Flock is so cheap, you can't really play around it, right? It's not like I'm telegraphing, oh, I've got three mana open like Absorb, right? It's one mana. So I think Guard the Flock is probably just a good... It's just really efficient for what it's doing. Um, little Foggy, the only reason why this little guy is in here, aside from having Sneak, right, is that it just is a great... Uh, it has great synergy with Paragon of Balance. So I think that's why we have this little guy, and I think he's super cute, and I love him, and I'm so glad we're playing him. So, Okay, Isochron Scepter, the first reference <laughs> to Telerian Academy. This costs one. Right, it does not cost two. Um, sorry for clicking on and off. I was trying to figure out if I needed to show something else. So it's going to cost one when we play it as the first artifact in our turn, and it's going to draw us two cards. That's why it's there. It's just sheer card advantage, um, and if it you know allows us to get removal spells that help us, sometimes it'll maybe get us something that we really really need. Um, sometimes it won't be that good, but I do think overall having some raw card advantage for like a small small price. Um, can be pretty powerful. We'll see though. This this is definitely experimental. Well, good turn. Never played with this card. Pretty excited too because um, it's just nice to play some good old fashioned flying magic. Two mana, two two flyer. Right. Can't really get more classic magic than that. Um, Paragon of Balance. You know, I went over right. Um, sometimes you'll have these really crazy starts right where you go Faithful Steed making itself a one three into like Lil Foggy, right? Or maybe a Welkin turn, and then you Paragon a balance, and who knows what they've played. Like if you play against Nahiri, all their stuff is gonna shrink down, right? Because most of Nahiri's creatures have higher power than toughness. So you just get to like kinda clean the slate and your your creatures get bigger, right? Fledgling Griff becomes a two two. Um there there's some really crazy curves of Paragon of Balance. And then you if you can slam your aura of courage, you know not soon after you play it, you're going to get so much value. On to the next artifact that we're playing, Icy Manipulator. Now, for anyone who played the Kiora build, right, that was sort of centered around travel supplies and this and a few other artifacts, you'll know that this card is, like, okay, right? It's not stellar. But in this deck with Teleri Academy, it's a two-mana artifact that says take a blocker out for two turns, right? And... We want to be connecting damage. We want to be up on tempo. Icy Manipulator is a two for one in that scenario. And if you're if it allows you to draw two additional cards or even one additional card, I think it's probably pulling its weight. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, Phantom Warrior. Pretty excited to play with this card. Um, obviously, a three mana three two is not the greatest rate, but it always has sneak, right? So. If this thing's living, you've got one of your two creatures that you need to connect each turn, and there's nothing your opponent can do about it. Like, they, they cannot block this, right, permanently. So, um, I'm excited to see if it pulls its weight as well. Call the Wind. I've seen how powerful Worm's Wake can be, right? Like, even when it's telegraphed that it's coming down, um, being able to have a, like, a solid creature to be able to attack with your following turn can sometimes be a huge tempo swing. And I think Call the Wind is cheap enough for what you're getting, which is a 3-2 flyer, right? Where you can maybe set up a turn where you're going like one drop, one drop, one drop, or one drop, two drop, and then you play this on turn three, and you basically play it when you know that it's going to help you draw that extra card. Um, again, very experimental, right? This is like early stages for me testing this deck, but to me, it makes sense with what we're trying to do. Yanling Sparrow, right? Also has lovely art. I just... Amazing. Uh, Yang Chen Li, you did an awesome job. I think this card is beautiful. Um, it's a 1-2 that comes into play makes a copy of itself, right? Again, very synergistic with Paragon, right? It's also just really solid with Aura of Courage, right? Um, because you're just going to get to pump two creatures... And obviously it's spotting you a creature for what Yanling does um, to be able to draw a card. So I'm a little skeptical on if this is good enough, right? It's like I think about spawning Arizoa, right, when it got nerfed into an O2 that copies itself. You know, it definitely got a fair bit worse. This is sort of similar, right, except it's a 1-2 for 
uh, another mana. Um, but I, I think if you're able to Paragon of Balance, if you're able to Aura of Courage, um, the card can do some work. So we'll, uh, we'll take that into account. Dungeon guys, super excited to play this card. Um, you know, I've thought about like the interaction between this card and Panharmonicon. It's possible maybe Panharmonicon deserves a slot here. Um, and that's something I'm going to think about because when this comes in and, um, you know, it locks something down and, and it's a, it itself is a flyer, right? It can peck in for damage. It can draw you more cards with handling. It can benefit from Aura of Courage. I think it, it is just a very good card. Um, also, you know, good into Liliana, right? Because Perma stunning something, if they're not going to kill your Dungeon Geist, um, definitely has a huge uh, impact on them. Pixie Trickster. Still, also, really, you know, not sure if this is the best card at this slot, but my thinking is this thing can do a lot of work in the meta. Um, making, you know, creatures tend to be pretty... I don't know. I just think a lot. Of, there are a lot of creatures that are really good for what you're paying for or they have really nasty effects that you have to deal with um you know shrinking something into a 3-3 frog and having a 3-1 flyer right again we're having all of these evasive creatures to be able to take advantage of tempo and having better card advantage than our opponents i think pixie trickster fits into that it's pseudo removal right it's also leaves behind a very relevant body that's a flying body to um continue snowballing your advantage with yanling River Dragon. On the fence. But I do think River Dragon is a good curve topper. If you're splashing white, you could be playing Heron, right? Which is plus one, plus one to all of your flying creatures. And I'll be real, that might be deserve two slots in the deck or one slot in the deck. But since I'm trying out some other white slots, I think River Dragon is a fine curve topper. It's not crazy. It's a little bit below rate, I think, for what you're paying for. But it, with the fact that you have Paragon of Balance and these evasive creatures, the plus one plus oh to everything, right, your ground creatures and your flying creatures, I think it can make an, a, a worthwhile difference. But we will definitely have to kind of look at how these games play out and see if River Dragon is in fact worth it. And now, one of my favorite cards, uh, shout out to you Buxfu and Beyond Bounds who had worked on the Fair Fight Gideon deck, which I think was incredibly strong in its heyday. Um, I wanted to play one copy of Fair Fight. Um, this is a card that I don't know that everyone's going to be familiar with, but uh, I think it's been really powerful in the old school Gideon decks for, you know, for as long as they were around. And so what is this doing? You're like, oh, why do you want to make everything a 4-4? Well, think about it. We've got Flyers, we've got Aura of Courage, we've got Paragon of Balance, if we are making all of our creatures 4-4s four and our opponents 4-4s, four and we've got Aura of Courage, again, you're creating another scenario where you're balancing the board, except you have evasive creatures, and you've got ways of pumping your creatures to attack through your opponent, right? So Fair Fight can honestly be incredibly backbreaking, and I don't think many people have played against this card, which also gives it a little bit of added value in my mind. So... I'm super excited to get into these games. We'll see how it goes. It might be rough. Who knows? You know, I'm only a couple games in. But um, I hope it makes sense kind of how we started constructing this deck. And I would love any feedback. I would love to hear what folks are thinking. And uh, other than that, let's just get into some games and see if Yen Lane can uh, bring home the, um, the turkey. Because it's flying. Um... I, I will say the games that I played were pretty close. Well, one of them was close. <laughs> but um, with a player named Ardvark, who I feel like I get matched into all the time. So shout out to them for, um, I think they're, they're a big Nahiri player. And uh, it really was down to the last turn. It was really, really close. Um, and then I played against Kiora. And they just didn't really have a lot of interaction early. And we got Aura of Courage like on turn four with some flyers. Um, so, you know, we kind of ran away with the game. Uh, I think if they had had Grudge Match and some other cards, it probably would have been a lot harder for us. Well, I'm glad we got this matchup because I think, I, obviously I don't know how the specific matchup goes, but I think aggro into Jace is, is not a bad place to be. All right, well, 
We definitely need a curve. I'm not too concerned about keeping one of these. I just want to curve out and make sure that we're applying pressure at a decent rate. And cool. So with Tolarian Academy, uh, Isochron is going to cost one. So turn one, we get to go Constrictor or Isochron. I'll probably start out with Constrictor and then get to go Constrictor Isochron. And then turn three, we've got Sparrow. Um, but we'll see how we curve out. Jace can sometimes put up a good defense. So, um, you know, with, with Crab as a 3-3 three, three for one, um, it might be a little tough, but uh, they're running Constrictor themselves. Um, but we also have Evasion. So, okay, Guardian Flock's pretty annoying, but uh, I love how she just says, look at you. It's like, is that good? Is that bad? I don't really know. She's just like, look at you. All right. I could go double one drop here. I think I will just uh, keep uh, keep my mana gem, especially because Guardian Guard of the Flock got you know um, sort of nerfed so to speak. I am gonna take this too though. Uh, I would rather it's sort of like you want to think about if you've ever played Gideon um, and sometimes Domri when you play uh, with Gaia's Cradle. You, you don't want to trade your creatures because your creatures have like a little bit more added incentive when you've got cards that really require you to go wide. Um, and, and we drew Faithful Steed, so we actually get to attack through here. So I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to play Faithful Steed and buff our snake to be able to attack through. I guess they're maybe holding a man, so that's certainly possible. Or disorient, I guess, but it doesn't look like it. And then I'm gonna play another mana constrictor. Um, I could run out scepter here. I'm a little tempted, but because I'm gonna play sparrow next turn potentially, or I might want a removal spell. But I, I'm really of the school of thought that like your fragile mana gem can really make a difference on certain crucial turns. And I think if you can afford it, usually you don't want to expend that as a resource. Um, but I could be wrong for that. We'll see. Okay. Well, we've got decent attacks with these. Um, so I think I'll start there. I could look for a removal spell off of, off of Isochron Scepter. That is a pretty decent line. I actually think I will start with that. Because we could still play Sparrow if we want to. Okay, we've got Nuzzle, Ulger's Evolution, and Revoke. I think Revoke is solid here. This will allow us to draw a card, so I think this is going to be worth it. Um, so it's obviously not a removal spell, but um, you know we get to attack for five here, and we get to draw a card. Also, I just love the feather graphic for this. <laughs> I think that's super sweet. So now we get a choice. Do we want to run out Will Foggy, or do we want to save our Mana Gem? At this point, I think I would rather um, just kind of keep pumping ahead, play Divine Smite out probably next turn. This person keeps seeing good game, so I guess I guess I'll I'll say that too. I don't I don't know if they're upset or if <laughs> there was a misclick. <laughs> I don't know. I think this way, you know, we play Foggy this turn, maybe they only have one creature, um, and maybe we're able to, you know, get through by, or by having Divine's Might next turn for four. Um, like, the thing that would be really annoying here is Jace's Apprentice, right? Like, we can't really attack through it. But even if that is the case, we can Divine's Might this and potentially get in. Um, okay, Repulse. All right, I definitely don't mind that. Um, makes the most sense, right? They get to take the buff off, but, like, we're still going to get some value out of Constrictor, which is not bad. Okay. I I'm assuming this is Remand, so um, I think I would like to play around that. But let's let's draw a card first. That's always my tip. Draw your card first. Um, I think I would prefer Grudge Match. And... Would I rather have a... I would rather have Foggy get this. And Balance Paragon would be good too. 
And we're going to have to deal with Remand at some point, but I think maybe Divine Smite... Hmm. Divine Smite gets countered. No, I just want to get my card. I think this makes the most sense. And not giving them a card off Remand is definitely, you know, pretty solid. Okay, Welcome Turn's a good draw. Uh, I will definitely run that out over anything else. Alright, well, definitely developing a pretty solid board. We've got Divine Smite potentially for 5 damage next turn if we need it. I'm definitely going to try and Divine Smite next turn because I do want to get Aura of Courage in the deck. But I'm also trying to play underneath this Remand because it will slow me down, but it also gives them a card. And if we can avoid... Like, at some point, they're going to have to use those two mana. Um, okay, interesting. It's a monstrosity. All right, well, gr great opportunity to use our Divine Smite, right? So that is what we're going to do. Um, and then it's probably Constrictor and Guard the Flock, just to keep the board presence rolling. Paragon's not doing anything here. It would buff the, the, the dog, but that's it. So, so pretty easy Divine Smite. Get Aura of Courage in our deck to try and resolve it. We're going to get to draw another card here. Yeah. Th this seems like a pretty tough matchup. Um, maybe if they're playing white, you know, and having Day of Judgment, that's a little easier. But I feel like we've also, like, really curved out to a, a crazy extent. Now we get to keep up Guard the Flock, potentially. I'd imagine they, if they have any spot removal, they'd want to kill Welcome Turn. So hopefully we can protect that. Yeah, and I mean, we just got a full board, which is, you know, pretty pretty good. But again, right, like all of these are one drops. All of these are really cheap creatures. And they're not doing a whole lot, but like, they do a lot when our opponent's like not really able to develop their board as much as they might want to. Here's the Apprentice, which would have been really good, you know, <laughs> on turn three, so... We definitely lucked out that they didn't get it till turn six. So I guess, you know, they could keep up remand. I don't know what else they could play on to. Maybe anticipate or something else. Looks like they're interested in just keeping that up. Um, okay. So I think we're just going to crash in here. I mean, there's... Uh, and there's no way for me to bait out... I mean, I could bait out something to get the Aura of Courage, but we've also got plenty of creatures, so let's just get in. They're going to eat, obviously, one of the Tutus. I wonder if they'll also chump the Welcome Turn. <coughs> no, not a little foggy. Interesting choice to not put one damage here. But I... Just drawing so many cards. <laughs> Alright, well, we've got War of Courage now. The question is, do I want to slam it, or do I want to continue to play underneath um, Remand? And I, th I think you just want to play underneath Remand. Now, they could have uh, Day of Judgment, right? We haven't seen... I don't think we've seen their splash yet. But I will... Uh, I'll take that chance. And I'm just going to prep both of these. And we'll see. Okay, Vindictive doesn't target, so I think that's why these didn't go off. It just says kill, right? Yeah, it's just at the end of the turn, destroy the strongest enemy creature. So, like, it technically doesn't target, I think, is how I would understand that interaction. Because it's, like, the same thing with, like, random... Like, uh, so with Inferno Titan, if you attack and deal three damage, you can hit a ward creature because it's random, so it doesn't count it as being targeted. One thing that's good about playing Remand this way is A, they're having one less card, right? Um, and B, okay, no, well, that's obviously pretty good. <laughs> um, countering the Repulse is probably good enough to win the game um, but also we can double slam Paragon of Balance next turn 
Um, so if they were made at once, we get to play it again. Yep. GG friend. I think that should be about it. Um, yeah, I don't even need to play Paragon. Uh... should be it. Alright. I mean, not really surprised that uh, this matchup the way it went the way it did, but also their hand seemed super awkward. Like, they had Remand since, like, turn four, and we didn't give it to them a single time. Um, and then their, you know, one repulse was pretty bad, right, on a 2-3 that then was going to come back and make some of their other cards cost more. And then we got to counter the four mana repulse, so um, obviously every, everything kind of came up really, really well for us. But I think, you know, that is that is the kind of matchup that Yan Ling, in theory, should be able to do well into. Um, I don't think we saw their splash, so I, I was interested, like, were they splashing? I've seen J splash green, I think that was in my last video. Obviously, J Splash White is kind of as old as as old as time. Um, there's also J Splash Red, which gives you access to like Blasphemous Act, Shock, Pyroclasm, um, which all can be really good ways of mopping up the board. Which like Jace doesn't inherently do well against. <laughs> What's up, Talaria? Um, just consistently the number one player um, and a, a solid teammate of mine. Uh, I don't think we're going to be very favored against this deck because they're going to gain a lot of life and ramp and I don't think we'll be able to keep up. Isochron is fine. I don't mind Sparrow. I forget how if they run Reach Creatures. Phantom's a little bit more reliable though, so I think I'm going to keep that and ship the Sparrow back for like a one or two. Okay. Well, we're not going to have early pressure, but if we draw the dog, maybe, that would be a decent start. Uh, why, Teleria, why do you gotta do me like this, friend? Alright, dog is, dog is good. We like that. Um, could play Scepter, but obviously I just want to get on the board. And get, uh, get Divine Smite rolling and all of that. Next turn we can Manipulator or Scepter. Yeah, they're... Ch this Channeler of Might, like Nissa kind of mid-range build... Because I, I can't remember if this is one turn kill. I don't know that it is. I don't think it is. This, this is really solid. So I guess the most efficient play is to manipulate it so we don't take three. <laughs> God, that just does not seem that good, though. But it is the most efficient. Honestly, I think we'll take three and not use this. Because I would rather save it for this turn, depending on what they play, right? So I can maybe attack through. Yeah, take the three. And decks like this are going to be really hard for Yanling because their creatures are just going to outpace yours. And that's pretty hard. So this is either Worm's Wake, which would be pretty rough for us, or it's nothing. But either way, it is a problem. Um... Alright, so I think we play Warrior here, and, oh boy, can we, should we be taking another three is the question I'm asking myself right now. If this is a Worm's Wake, the answer is yes, because I need to stun that, so I, th I think we just have to be okay with it. Okay, no Worm's Wake. I, I didn't, I'm not really sure what uh, Teleri is running these days. We've talked a bit in the team of, like, different Nissa builds. Oh, damn. Yep, yeah, that is uh that's a bit of a bummer. This is a nice divine smite target, and I would rather keep my creature on the board, so I think that's gonna be the plan. Um that might be really telegraphed, though, obviously, because like why would I not do that? But I think I'm gonna lead with Ice Crone. Oh, interesting. Alright, well warning flame. Kind of does a good impression, but there's also Revoke and Anticipate. 
Um, I'll take Revoke. I th well, this is close. I really do need to Divine Smite this to get that rolling, though. This is also very efficient. Oh, God. Alright. I'm going to take Revoke. I think that's correct. Yeah. This is pretty tough. I mean, not really... We're curving out in the sense that we're playing spells on curve, but we're not pressuring. Um, and we're not drawing cards. So, um, And that grudge match was brutal. So I, I don't really know what we can do to... Uh, <laughs> To really get back in the game here, but okay, just Oakenhide, just repair. I guess the Oakenhide can be more useful. Um, I think probably here it's just going to be River Dragon. Don't think there's much else to be doing. And then next turn we can maybe. Use our Oakenhide. Obviously, it'd be better to use Oakenhide after fair fighting. I mean, they have so many options avail available to them, and it's just going to be really hard for us to connect because we don't have another evasive creature. So I'm, I do not have a lot of hope for, <laughs> for the game for us here. Um, Alright, well this feels like a fine opportunity to stun um, Druid and just kind of get the beatdown going. So I think I'm going to do that. Um, I think I would... Oakenhide makes this a better attacker, so I, I guess that's worthwhile doing. Uh, my guess would be he blocks. Yeah, Smart. I mean, you know, wants to stop me from getting a free card, right? And I, I think that's correct. Um, Alright, well, prep call the wind here. Teleria might be able to guess what we're <laughs> what we're up to. Because um, having four mana open is pretty unlikely that we don't have anything to do. So we'll see. I mean, fair fight for any big creatures might really come in handy. You know, I, I don't I don't know if it's gonna be enough. Okay, well, yeah, there's the Crusher Worms. Well, there's Aura of Courage, huh? Oh, wow. All right, I need to think. All right, so if I have to take 12 plus 3, right, so 15, I get to pump, I get to attack here for... Quite a lot, and then I can fair fight and get even more through next turn. So I, th I think it has to be. Stun you. Stun you. Aura. Draw a card. Past turn. So we're going to take at least six. And I think their life pool, their life total is probably just too high for us to have enough time to close things out. But we'll see. Drawing Aura the or of Curse there was pretty important. I mean, Isochron would be a good draw. Oh, no. <laughs> running Vine Snare Hunter. Yeah, that's... That's pretty problematic. But, um... Yeah, I mean, there's really only one line here, so... Let's just make all of them 4-4s, four and then our guys become 5-5s. Five fives. Man, without Vine Snare, I think we actually had a pretty good shot, but 
Re really, probably just a really good card for the meta right now. Or, or at least if you're running into Ian Lang, I, th I think Vine Snare Hunter is a card you should be playing if you're playing green. Um, all right, I mean, if they're attacking, we can probably block one and take the other. We could potentially take eight here, but I don't know how much that does for us. Paragon's not going to be kind either, obviously, because our toughness is lower. We can attack through the Hunter, so that's good. I don't think he would want to attack here, because then we get 5 damage through if we block. But, I mean, Flurry's got 8 cards in hand <laughs> from Draga Druid, just drawing at least a card a turn for the last few turns, so... Not ideal. But, you know... Having fair fight honestly is making this game like a game. So I, I think at least there's that. <clears throat> okay, are they just gonna pass and flip, draw some more cards, gain some life? That seems pretty good. Not a whole lot I can do. But, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm definitely going to block here. Feel pretty good about that. Question is, do I block this? And I think, I mean, I think so, right? Like, just drawing them cards. Yep, flip, flip. They gain three life. Get to flip their other werewolves. I do think this is probably the only other deck besides Dharma that makes really, really good use of that. Okay, I mean, Manipulator. I said it was a draw, and it, it definitely is. Um, Alright, so the best thing I can do is trade up on this. Um, so I could stun this so that they have to trade their 4-4, which is not bad. And then I can go Griff into Balance. I mean, Balance also just really hits this. So that's that's not bad. Okay. Um, all right, so let's let's do that. Both get pumped. They could honestly take eleven if they want to, but I think it's fine for them to block here. Yeah. All right, I don't have much else that I can do. Um, Downgrades one of their creatures, buffs one of ours. It's good enough, but our opponent has... Teleri's got 16 mana and 21 life, so... And a full grip. I... I don't think we have any other draws in our deck. I forget if he runs Lava Wave, too. Um, but that, that wouldn't seem reasonable. Okay. Probably a Titan coming down here, would be my guess. Oh, Strahd. Oh, and they've got it. GG. Damn. I I didn't even I wasn't even sure if they were running the OTK in there, but I I like that build. Well, anyone who's a Nissa fan, I know you didn't get to see all the cards in the deck, but <laughs> I would hop on over and try and uh, guess what Tolera is playing over there, because yeah, I mean just just really solid really outpaced us uh, pretty hard. Alright. Let's see if we can get one more W here. Okay. Alright, I, I played this matchup once before. Um, if we can get a good start, I think it's it's reasonably favorable. Oh, they're running Talarian Academy too. Alright, so we've got one, two, three. 
which is not bad. But I think I'm actually going to mull this and try and hit an actual creature. Yeah, okay. I think I think you really need to go two or three creatures in the first two turns to have the best shot at getting your deck rolling. Um, but it's making me think about, like, this deck might really benefit from playing haste creatures, right? Like, just being able to try and have as much tempo as possible. So, obviously, red has some pretty good haste creatures. Um, I'm not really sure what, like, black would offer this deck, but probably worth taking a look at. Nice, we've got our, our steed. Um, if we want to attack past something here, we might want a constrictor, but also I really want to get smite in the deck. I'm not going to think too hard about this. I'm just going to slam steed, get divine smite in our deck, pass the turn. See what they do. If they've got Isochron, they can run that out. Okay. Constrictor's fine. There's the Divine Smite on four, which is pretty unfortunate. Um, I don't think there's really any sense in trading here. Like, trading a point for a point. Obviously, because we've got Paragon. So, and if we draw Paragon next turn, we're definitely going to slam it. But we've also got Sparrow next turn, so... You know, Sp Sparrow synergy with Divine Smite is nice. Mm, I don't think I'm interested in trading here. Well... Actually, I think it's probably fine to trade. So I'm not Divine Smiting. Yeah, I'll, I'll trade. So if we drew, draw a Paragon, it's like pretty solid with both of these already. Zinder Spilts. Okay. Alright, well, I'm I'm just going to go for Sparrow here to set up Divine Smite and to draw some extra cards. I think that's probably the way. And I'm going to save Little Foggy, obviously. Like, pecking in for a point doesn't do anything. I really want to utilize the Sneak as a way to draw cards. But currently, right now, we've got Sparrow. So even if they remove Little Foggy or Sparrow, we should have enough to... Uh, oh, Gauntlet of Ogre Power. Interesting. Well, I don't, don't love that, but I am going to take five because... Ooh, we've got Balance, but we've got Divine Smite for it next turn. Um, and obviously, all my creatures die to it, so I will take the five. Let's see. Yep, I mean, pretty clear to me. And I'm not going to attack with Little Foggy, right? Because, again, I, just, I think I just want to save um, that with Paragon. But I imagine they take three. We get to draw a card here, which is excellent. Peck in for some damage. We get Aura of Courage in our deck. Which is obviously really good with what we've got going on right now. Um, I mean, Paragon and Welkin turn looks like a pretty good next turn. Interesting. I'm not super interested in taking another five, so I think I will block here. <coughs> we have already got enough evasive creatures, like... I might as well save myself five life here. And unless they can interact with both Flyers and, and Foggy, we should be able to uh, connect. Hoping so. Okay. Respect. Respect that play, for sure. Um... 
Aragon does just do a lot of work here. I do really want to get Aura of Courage rolling, though. Oh, man. Which, which honestly might be more worth it, but we have a better turn. We have a better curve with this, so I think... I think I like this more. Let's balance the scales. Let's get in. Draw our card. Alright, River Dragon's also a fine play next turn. Play another flyer. Definitely a, a much more ideal curve um, than before. And honestly, I might trade one of the flyers here, just because we've got River Dragon, which we could slam next turn, um, and we don't even have a slot for it, so pretty down to save another five life. Oh, okay. That's, that's not the biggest deal. Alright, um, yep, I'll just save myself some life, and I'll take the four here. That's fine. Whether we play Aura of Courage or River Dragon, I think there's no need to block there. Okay, what is this? I'm, if I'm playing this deck, I would guess that it's Negate. So my my inclination is to play River Dragon here. So I'm going to do that. All right. Yep, trade. Take some damage, draw another card. Well, Fog. Not so good after Paragon is down, but that's okay. Alright. I'm thinking that was Negate. I could be wrong. Alright. And there you have it, folks. <laughs> so. I think... You know, what's really clear is that Yanling, if she curves out the get gate, like most aggressive decks, it's going to be really hard to deal with her. Because as soon as you start snowballing to draw an extra card every turn as an aggressive deck, where you're also applying pressure, and it's hard for them to interact with you, right? Unless you have cards like the Vine Snare Hunter, right? Which, like, obviously has a, a tremendous impact on your ability to close out the game. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I like, it's hard to tell a little bit of like how impactful the artifacts are. Um, like Icy Manipulator definitely does open up certain pathways and Ice Ground Scepter, I think just is like a pretty solid card to be playing because it's card advantage. You can get some spells that interact with your opponents that you can't, you wouldn't normally have slots for. Um, I'm not sure the artifact package is the end-all be-all, but I will say, I think Oath of the Paladin, I think Paragon of Balance, and Fair Fight, um, I, I think those those white slots make a lot of sense to me. And I, I, I would advocate that Fledgling Griff is worth running, because as you can see, when we can go like triple one-drop, or one-drop, two-drop, kill your thing, right, or like uh, you know, stun your thing, draw a card. You know, those sorts of curves are just... It's its really, really accelerating your ability to just overwhelm your opponent with card advantage as an aggressive deck. Um, so, I mean, I, at first glance, I think that she's she, she is winning the matchups that she should. All right, this is something I actually said about Teferi. Um, I think it was the last patch or patch before, where it was like, Teferi is in a fine spot. He's winning against the matchups he should, which I think at that 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 time was aggro. And then he got kind of buffed, right? I think his staff gave him two cards. And then it was like, oh, actually Teferi could deal with aggro, but also could deal with mid-range and control, right? And it was like not, you know, maybe in the in the quote-unquote fairest place um, and, and did get nerfed this patch. 
Um, I say all that to say that I think Yenling is going to punish control decks straight up. I think she also has the ability to win against other aggressive decks, right? If she gets the right curve, if they don't have enough interaction, if you get the ball rolling or you get like a really punishing Paragon of Balance or Aura of Courage, um, I think she's got the tools to do it. Um, so far, I've really liked Geist. I've really liked Pixie Trickster. I think River Dragon is doing what it's doing and it, I think it's doing it fine. Um, I really like Mana Constrictor, Lil Foggy. Um, I think Welka Turn, although we don't really have too many two drops, even though Icy Manipulator is technically a two drop with Talarian Academy. Um, I think Welka Turn does what it needs to do. Phantom Warrior is susceptible to Grudge Match and some of those other cards because it's only got two toughness and it's coming down on turn three. So it might not be good enough. Um, it might just be a little too weak but again if your opponent stumbles this deck will run over them right like when you have enough sneak creatures you've got enough early and uh, early aggression to get you know draw those extra cards and just have so much more decision making power as an aggro deck um you should win those games so you know i think uh in terms of thinking about metagame right and i'll close out here thanks everybody for for joining for this one this was a lot of fun i'm super excited to also showcase the next build and we'll see if we can get that up on the channel soon um i think the things to reflect on here are basically okay are you seeing a lot of control i personally have not so that might mean that yanling is you know really only able to fight with a third of the field which is more on the aggro side um but again like you can also maybe deck build to account for that. Like, maybe she does lend herself to an, a sort of aggro strategy from my point of view, but maybe you build her taller and you play, um, I don't know, you could play like Avacyn and like some other cards and like, boom, you've got like a flying army. Um, I don't know. I'm spitballing here, right? But um, I'd love to hear what you guys think and what you've been building with her. But so far, I feel that sh at least with this deck construction, you are build you are beating the decks you're supposed to beat, and I feel like that's always a good place to start when you're first testing. It's like oh, okay, they have a slow draw, punishing it, right? If they don't play around certain tricks well, punishing them. If they aren't expecting Paragon of Balance or, you know, um, my uh, guard the flock at the right time, okay, I can punish them. Uh, that's what it seems like. But I think mid-range, you know, whether that's Nissa, whether that's Domri, um, whether that is, you know, Chandra probably has a decent matchup here, unless you get, you know, certain interactions, like maybe Guard the Flock is, is good enough to protect you. I don't know. Um, but I think anything that is playing bigger, beefier creatures, so Vivian, right, comes to mind too. Like, unless you're getting really accelerating, um with your draw like you've got enough evasion to get through early to really just draw these extra cards and and be um you know just pouring creatures onto the board which we did for the games that we won um there's just i think to sum it all up she's got a lot of cases where you're playing cards that work well together but if you're not sequencing if you're not able to sequence in the right order um she's really susceptible uh to to being weak you know that, that she has a lot of weakness so kind of like Gideon Gideon can be extremely punishing to certain decks and then okay into others and then really bad into other ones I would put Yenling kind of there as well like she's beaten beating like the third to maybe 40 maybe 50 percent of the field that she's supposed to and then she's probably going to lose very easily to the other 50%. This is just on my feeling, on some of my observations. Go out, prove me wrong. Tell me the most broken Yan Lang build. Um, and uh, at the very least, boot up some games with her and have fun. She's a new planeswalker. She's got you know some uniqueness to her. Um, and uh, as you can tell, I definitely had a lot of fun. And we will catch you next time. Thank you so much.